Welcome to Renegade Inc, the show that allows us to think differently. On this program, we've managed to locate the rarest of things, namely a banker that actually went to prison for financial malpractice. But what should be a story of crime, punishment and justice has another chapter with a potentially political subplot. Having served his sentence, the so-called rogue trader who cost a bank around £1.3 billion now has the fight of his life to stay in the UK, a country that he's called home since he was 12 years old. Kwaku Adeboli is the former UBS trader who has served his sentence for fraud and is now fighting deportation to Ghana, and he joins me in the studio. Kwaku, welcome. You've hey, been busy. Yeah, it's been a it's been, a, been on a bit of a journey. Many people will have seen the press shots of you either in court or going to jail. But for people who don't know the story, give us the context and tell us sequentially what has happened, why it's happened, and why we're in this position. To take it as quickly as I can, um, I was a trader at UBS. Um, I was asked to join the biggest trading book in the bank in September of 2006, a year before the financial crisis began. And the, just on a specific, is that on their prop desk? Is, is that on using the bank's money to trade in markets? To It was called the ETF and index desk. Exchange Traded Funds and Index Desk. It's a $50 billion book. The purpose of the book was to provide protection to our clients by basically taking on their risks. Um, we were going into these dislocations in the marketplace that we saw from 2007 to 2009, and they transferred those risks to us. Now, our job was to find a way to offset the cost of those risks. Right. So it's a hedge in, in broad hedge terms. Those costs, right. yeah, or those risks. The problem was that Actually, these dislocations were unprecedented, so a lot of the risks were unhedgeable. So we had to find ways to generate enough profit to offset the losses that were resulting from the dislocations and unhedgeable risks. Great. So we had a dual mandate. One mandate was to service our client positions, and because the book was so big, our other mandate was also to trade proprietary, i.e. taking the, using the bank's money to take risk on behalf of the bank to generate profits for the bank. Are and those two things mutually exclusive or are they actually symbiotic and you can do those things? Well, they are symbiotic in the sense that what the large investment banks do is they use the cover of these large client positions to actually facilitate proprietary risk taking. Right. So if you can kind of fast forward to the end of the crisis, we're now in 2009, we've got the Volcker rule coming in that sort of trying to stop proprietary risk taking. Desks like mine were the last bastion of proprietary okay. risk taking because they were client desks that also took massive proprietary risks. Then what happened? Well, in 2009, um, we got a new CEO, uh, Ozzy Grubel, who basically asked us to take more risk mm -hmm. because UBS had gone through this sort of near-death experience during the crisis. We'd right. lost six, $60 billion through subprime losses, and the bank had gone through this sort of existential crisis. We'd lost, like, we had this massive brain drain as our best people left. And after a series of management changes from 2007 to 2009, he came in and was trying to stable the ship. The problem is that with a, with a book as complex and as big as ours, we had to create a bunch of mechanisms to manage that risk and to offset the stuff that we couldn't hedge properly. So we built this process called the umbrella, which was an extension of other existing processes. And you were involved in that build? Yes, absolutely. So as a desk, that it was a very small desk. Mm -hmm. um, in 2007, there were just two of us. Between myself and my supervisor, we had 30 months experience of trading and we were managing this $50 billion book. So when we got to sort of 2009, 2010, the mechanisms we developed to protect the book during the crisis, this umbrella, we used to take the risk that we were being asked to take. Right. In layman's terms, what does that mean day to day? Well, what it means day to day is that you kind of hit the desk at six o'clock in the morning. If you can imagine a book with 4,000 stocks on it, we would get a request for a decision yeah, of yeah. some kind every 40 seconds, constant intensity, like nonstop. And that would go on until about five, six o'clock when the European market would close. But because it was a global book and we were running positions round the clock, you might have to sit at the desk till nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, and then you probably go home, pass out, it gets to midnight, have to repeat, start again. Right. So, but you're watching Japan overnight and China overnight. Right. Let's jump forward a little bit sequentially because there's a moment where you metaphorically get a knock on the door, as in your 
in work and something uh, isn't going right. Yeah. Tell us about that moment. In June of 2011, we generated $135 million of profit for the bank, mm -hmm. all told. Our desk of four kids. And, but we were part of this bigger group called Global Synthetic Equities. And Global Synthetic Equities had been created to generate, to create a ton more profit from this product set. This Delta One, it's called. Deutsche Bank was making like $3 billion a year from this product. I think the number three position was making $900 million a year from this product globally. UBS was making $150 million. Right, so you, right. Were, the, you were the small change. We basically. were a small change. We were in position nine in the league table, right? right? And the idea was we need to get up the league table. Because you need to take more risk. Because, you know, we, to get up the league table, you need, you need to take more risk. We're trying to rebuild our brand and How'd our you reputation. How do you get up that league table? So the way you get up the league table is by taking more risk. If you need to increase your profitability by a factor of six in one year, you you're going to take, six take, times, more, yeah, six times take more risk. Okay. You're take more risk. The problem is that we'd gone through this um, sort of existential crisis. Part of UBS is very risk averse. Mm -hmm. And part of UBS is our CEOs trying to push us to being more risk loving. Quite right? a dichotomy. And guess who has to stand in the middle? It's the traders who stand in the gray zone. And obviously we're on this book, the biggest book in the bank, a thousand times bigger than the average equities trading book. So yeah. we've got 50 billion, the average book's $50 million. Yeah. We're taking all the risk, generating all the profits. But then we get to June of 2011 and there's this big argument on the trading floor. Is the market gonna go up or down? There's a large group of guys who are like, the market's going to go up, backed up by a huge piece of research. And then there's a small group of us analysts who are like, I think there's something wrong. We, we'd seen the earthquake in Japan, U.S. debt downgrade, U.S. debt ceiling, Greek Greece. Debt, debt crisis, right. you know, social so, unrest. And, so, and that's the macro that's environment. The macro so, your environment. View, so your view was this, this is going to hell in a handbasket. Yes. Backed by this research that the bank's got is actually this market is going to fly. Yeah. And so, so, so you've got this, di this divergence and it turns into a big fight yeah. and I'm kind of fighting the corner going, you know, the market's going to crash. Like, right. you know, we need to be careful. And what happened then? What happens is increasingly senior guys start coming to my desk saying, Kweku, you're not towing the party line. You're undermining our house view. And I got taken outside, literally taken outside. If you continue down this path on your own and something goes wrong, you will be disowned. Like literally. Those were the words. So eventually, Karsten Kangetter, the CEO of the bank, comes to me and a couple of others and says to us, look, Axel Weber, one of the members of the board of the ECB, who's about to become chairman of UBS, has told us that the ECB is about to take a number of steps that's going to cause the market to rocket. More quantitative easing. More quantitative easing. The message was, basically, Quaker, you're wrong. So I go, well, <laughs> if the CEO of the bank says I'm wrong, I must be wrong and I flip my positions, go along with the house view. On the day that we do that, July the 1st, the market starts to crash and we just panic, lose control. And as the market crashes up to 40% in some of the markets we were trading, we just bought more and more and more. As it's going down? As it's going down. You're buying the stuff? Yeah, because the idea is that, well, just hold or buy more because when it bounces, then you make the money back. How do you hold those positions? Well, using the umbrella, you know, there's this group of people inside our bubble okay. who know what the trades are. Yep. And then eventually the problem is that the losses become unmanageable and there are people outside our bubble starting to ask questions. And at that point, you know, eventually it becomes unmanageable. And so eventually, you know, fast forward to September 14th of 2011, we make an agreement on our desk that I'm going to take responsibility for various reasons. I'm going to take responsibility on my own. We decide what to put in the email to make sure it's isolated to me, to protect the desk, to protect the bank, etc. I send the email and then all hell breaks loose. What's the next step after that email was received? I get called back into the office, um, up to the seventh floor, um, a series of questions. The bank brings me some lawyers, and then we continue the conversation until about 1 a.m. They tell me, well, just last, we just got to sort some stuff out, then you can go home. And then half an hour later, they come back and they say, we know we said you could go home, but unfortunately we had to call the police. So they're coming to arrest you. This is about one o'clock in the morning. So they arrested you one o'clock in the morning. You then went to the police station. You're in the police station for how long? Until like Friday, so um, about two, 48 hours or something, and then 
a couple of days, and then eventually you're charged. What are you charged with? At that point, one count of fraud by abusive position mm -hmm. and one count of false accounting. Right. And how long did the trial last for? The trial lasts for nine weeks. Nine weeks. And, and, then, and it's a jury trial? It's a jury trial. And what were the verdicts? We get through, the jury goes out to determine to, you know, I'm on the stand for like six days, right? UBS's lawyer is passing notes back and forth and it's like literally like fighting an army. <laughs> and we get to the end and the jury goes out to deliberate and they come back and they say to the judge after about two days, um, if we don't think he intended to make a gain for himself, but that he intended to make a gain for the bank, can we find him guilty? And the judge goes, no, you can't. You can't find him guilty of false accounting if you don't think he intended to make a gain for himself. But you can find him guilty of fraud because in the fraud charge, he doesn't have to have had an intent to make a gain for himself. He only needs to have intended to expose the bank to the risk of loss. So they go away, deliberate for another day or so. Then they come back and find me not guilty of the false accounting charges because yes. clearly they realize this wasn't about me, but the bank, but they find me guilty of fraud. So the judge starts sentencing me, making his, and he says out loud, you know, the fraud is the big thing. And then at that point, four members of the jury start crying. I'm kind of sat in the box, I'm looking at them and I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. Everything's gonna be all right, like, you know? Um, and it was actually really sad because over nine weeks or 10 weeks, you, you start to build a bond with everyone in the courtroom. Of course, it's quite sad. But yeah, so I got sentenced to seven years. Uh, and served three and a half of it. And then I was released in the summer of June, 2015. How was that? The difficult thing about my time in prison was that I spent the whole time fighting the home office, right? So as soon as you're convicted, someone comes to your cell and says, here's a piece of paper, you're, you're liable to automatic deportation. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. I'm in the studio with a former UBS trader, Kwaku Adaboli, who, after serving his time for fraud, is now fighting deportation back to a country that he hasn't lived in since the age of four. I just want to talk about the culture at UBS. How did people not know that something was going awry on the trading floor? Or a better question, who else knew? Well, in the end, there were 19 other people who were either fired or asked to leave the bank. And there was one other who was banned by the regulator. Right, but, but what about senior management? Because ultimately, where my question, I suppose, and what I'm getting at is, where does the buck stop? In highly complex systems, yes. the way that you protect yourself as a senior leader is kind of send down a message. In our case, it was emails that had headlines, capital letters, revenue, 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 or being pulled into a meeting where we're like, we want you to push the boundaries. And then you ask, how far should I push? And they go, until you get a slap on the back of the wrist. Right, just, so it's delegation, but it's not taking responsibility correct. for the delegation. Correct. But they must have an inkling, because if you're getting those emails saying revenue, 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 if the CEO at the time in your organization is saying, look, we need to take risk, but we also need to be conservative, mm. they can't plead that much naivety Correct. And, and in our case, you know, there are emails going upwards saying, you know, we made $10 million today and the way we made it was by taking this risk. And there was one day where the, the, desk, the, the floor, the whole trading floor lost $13 million and we made $10 million. Normally, if we made $10 million, we'd put $5 million in the umbrella and report five. But on that day, my supervisor was like, just release all $10 million. There's high fives all around. And the reality is to make $10 million on a day where the market only moves 1%, you need to have had a billion dollars of risk on. The senior leaders know. There's no way they don't know the level of risk that's being taken. They, and like there are explicit conversations where the global head of GSE comes to the desk and says, you know, um, well done for yesterday, making $10 million. But if anybody asks, you need to say that your risk limit is X, although we understand that you have to go beyond that to generate the type of profits that we're asking you. Do you think those four members of the jury that were crying or were upset, or, or that jury in general, understood that that was the culture of that organisation, not least because you were fighting an army of people who were passing notes back and forth to one another, and they could see clearly that actually that's the culture and that's the atomic sort of pressure that these traders, traders like you, had to operate under? Absolutely. And I also think that what they were fighting against was a responsibility to hold a banker to account, right? They're probably sat there going, we are representing society in this situation and everyone's asking for bankers to be held to account. So we've got to find a way to do it. Mm. And I think they sat there and went, wait, 
it's not about him as an individual. It's about the industry as a whole. So we'll find him guilty of the crime that represents the bank, mm -hmm. but we'll find him not guilty of the thing that represents himself. So the door slams on the cell. You're lying on your bed. The option there is to become very angry. I mean, ultimately, I was on bail in prison, on remand. Uh, so it wasn't for that, nine months. So right. I'd already, it's kind of like I'd already given, I'd had put my training wheels on. And then now it's like, okay, you're going to do the main bit of your sentence now. But the first thing that happens when you're convicted is the home office turns up, you know, bang, bang, here's a piece of paper, you're liable to automatic deportation. Was that a bolt out of the blue? Because on, on the detail, you're not a British citizen even though you've lived here all your life? I moved to the UK at the age of 12 right. without my own family, and I went to boarding school. And you do not expect at any point for someone to say, well, actually, we're going to deport you. you, you know, I had indefinite leave to remain. You, you feel British. You think British. There's no part of you that thinks that you're going to get deported. You're like, well, I've been given a sentence. I'll do my time, and I'll do it in a purposeful, positive way. Mm. Try and learn as much from this as possible. Take lessons that I can give back to society from it. That'll be that. But then the home office gets a hold of me and it becomes a battle, right? So you're trying to sort of fix yourself. Rehabilitation begins immediately if you're a responsible person. But at the same time, you've got the home office trying to crush you. Who was the then home secretary? Theresa May. Right. And what I hadn't realized was that the hostile environment policy had started to kick off. And at exactly the same time as my criminalization process was happening, the hostile environment policy was being implemented. So around the time I got bail in June, July of 2012, the 2012 Immigration Act was released, which made it impossible for anyone who gets a sentence over four years to make an argument that there are compelling reasons to not be deported. When did it start to crystallize that oh, I'm actually in a fair bit of trouble here? Initially, you think, well, I've got I have family and friends here. I've been here for 20 odd years. I feel British. Surely my human rights will protect me, right? That's, so you just fill in all this documentation. Like, and you're going through the motions. Yeah, it's like, fine, I'm not going to get deported. Like, come on. And then in September of 2013, I get sent to Maidstone Prison, which is a foreign national jail that's designed to make your life so horrible, even in prison, totally dystopian, that you choose to deport yourself, okay? So you can imagine this prison of 700 odd men, hopeless place. I shouldn't have been there because I was a super low risk offender. But then the home office starts to manipulate the process. My risk gets increased, etc. I have to go get the prison and probation ombudsman in to investigate what's happening. Eventually the prison and probation ombudsman tells the, the prison that they have to send me to an open prison because the home office had manipulated the process to keep me there for 14 months. And the reason they do that is to break your family ties and to separate you from your community so that then it's easy to say it's the deportation is justified. But I fought so hard, eventually they sent me to an open prison. Then of course, at that point, it becomes very difficult to deport me straight away, so they have to release me. I get immigration bail, I get released, I come out, follow this legal process for three years, appeal after appeal, every single court says, no, you gotta go. Um, and in June of this year, Eventually, I ran out of road at the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal said, sorry, mate, there's no compelling reasons not to deport you. You've got to go. I, at the same time, was lodging a judicial review because I was like, but the Home Office has broken the law like 83 times in my case. And I'd mapped it all out and I gave it to the court. And I was like, here's a judicial review. They've broken the law. They've made it harder for me to show the compelling reasons not to deport me. So we, we submitted that in June. And then the Home Office applied to the court to expedite the decision on that application and to rule that it was completely without merit and that um, renewal of that process should not be a bar to my removal. Okay? So in August of this year, you're suddenly like, oh my God, they're coming for me. Like, they're coming for me. Like, got lawyers, got processes, legal process, but you're like, they're going to do whatever they can to get rid of me. And then, boom, I get a letter from the judge basically saying, your application has been thrown out totally without merit. It's an abusive process. You can't renew it. If you renew it, it's not a bar to your removal. Basically, you're on borrowed time. Now, what's interesting, I was, I was due to do a piece of work with the counterterrorism unit of the UK Special Forces. So we kind of wrote to the Secretary of State and said, you know, I'm supposed to do this three-day course. Can you? And what was that on? It was based on leadership, decision-making, risk-taking in the, in the gray zone, learning from mistakes. The Secretary of State allows me to go to the SAS thing, come back on a Thursday, go home to Scotland, and I go to report on a Monday, and I get arrested. 
that's when the accelerated process starts. So they put me in Dungavel Detention Center. Mm. Apparently it's not a holiday location. It's a dystopian hellhole. I was there for about 10 days um, under increasing pressure from the home office, you know. They literally come to you and go, right, you've been here five days now. Will you accept your um, voluntary removal? And this is a ratchet process. It's a ratchet process. You've literally got a home office guy screaming at you going, sign this document. If you don't sign this document, you'll be non-compliant. You'll never get bail. So I'd been there like eight days, nine days. On the Tuesday, he goes to and I get pulled in. I, I got pulled in every single day. I got pulled in again. And he goes, right, well, will you sign this document? I'm like, no, I can't because my MP and my lawyer have told me not to because I need to protect my human rights. So he goes, all right, well, I should warn you, you could get moved around the country. And I'm like, why would you move me? And he goes, well, you know, for logistical purposes. And I'm like, well, like what? He's like, you know, bed space. I was like, this prison has 65 people. It has a capacity of 250. Come on. The next day. You're in a sweat box. I'm in a sweat box with four escorts, a van with four men in it for little old me, driving from Dungavel in Scotland, Ayrshire, down to Harmonsworth. Next, next door to Heathrow. When we didn't realize this at the time, but it became very obvious that there was a reason why they're accelerating this process. So people start looking and one charity, de anti-deportation detention group, figures out that there's a flight, a charter flight to Nigeria and Ghana on the Tuesday. And that they're moving me south so that they can put me on that flight. And if you can imagine one of these detention flights, you know, um, it's two by two. So you have two escorts for every detainee or deportee. Okay. Imagine a plane chartered at incredible cost, private, private jet with 50 detainees, all chained to their seats, shackled to their seats, with 100 escorts. Let's imagine this plane, like a reverse slave ship for the 21st century. Just heartbreaking stuff. Luckily for me, the Monday before this flight, the court agrees that there should be an injunction against my removal and that the new judicial review application should be heard. Personally, I think if someone has spent three and a half years in prison and the court has decided that that's the adequate punishment, then people need to question themselves. Why do you want this person to be deported? Is it because you actually still want them to be punished some more? And if that's the case, you know, the government says, you know, we need to deal with offending in a robust way and it needs to be a deterrent to other foreign nationals as to the standard of behavior we expect in this country, what we're effectively doing is we're creating a double standard, right? We're creating second-class citizens. That's the true purpose of this. It's not about protecting the nation, because I'm no risk to anyone. The Home Office always brags and says, 44,800 people have been deported foreign national criminals, as if it's something to boast about, when in reality what they've done is they've broken 44,800 families. I'm not saying don't deport foreign national offenders, but there has to be a nuance. If someone was born here or grew up here from being a child, we created them. You can't just export our problems halfway around the world. As we sit here now then, um, and you've described two cultures, the culture at UBS and the culture at the Home Office. What's your view on what the logical next step is going to be? I'm deeply concerned because the two processes are deeply linked. Our increasing authoritarianism and focus on migration is a result of the after effects of the financial crisis, the increasing inequality, et cetera, okay? So what we do is we focus on individuals in the financial industry to pretend that it's about individuals rather than the industry as a whole. But then the inequality and the effects of that um, process are continuing to affect the people of the world, of the country. So what you do is you focus on immigration to make it look like it's those people at the bottom of society and you put the immigrants below the people at the bottom so they've got someone to point a finger at. It's a very dangerous situation because once you start on this pathway, it's like the 1930s pathway, right? Because Why? Why is that? You have this increasing divide, increasingly right-wing part of society who you need to uh, appease in order to maintain power, to mm -hmm. control power. And in these types of environments, you get increasing authoritarianism. With that in line, you're going to keep going to the right to convince the people on the far right. And of course, the further you go to get them, their votes, the further you push them down that pathway. So and you it have becomes self-fulfilling. Correct. And you have to keep ratcheting up right. the narrative. If you go back to 2010, 2011, 2012, when this hostile environment policy was being built, we needed to qualify Article 8 for a second time to reduce its power as a protection. Right? So there's a concerted effort by our government 
to weaken the reliance on Article 8 as a human rights, um, family and private life. And what we did was we used foreign national offenders, right? Because if you bring offenders into it and say we need to reduce the rights of offenders, no one argues against it politically, right? You can't stand there and go, well, I want to protect criminals, well, so it's right? A, yeah. So you use the offenders to weaken the protections and then everyone else all the other immigrants suffer. And increasingly, you have to ratchet up this process. Mm -hmm. Just this weekend, a Sri Lankan man with super high um, blood pressure is being deported back to Australia. The doctors have said that he's likely to die on this flight. And so what the Home Office does, rather than say, we won't deport him, is, oh, we'll give him four doctors to fly with him. In case if something happens, we can resuscitate him. And for me, this perfectly reflects what happened at the bank. It's the kind of excess risk taking in pursuit of a really difficult and impossible goal that, re that leads to catastrophic failure. Why? Because the goal becomes so important that leadership sends a message to the guys at the coalface and says, we want you to achieve this outcome no matter what. Take whatever risk you want to achieve it, and we'll sanction that. As a result, the guys on the coalface are unable to feed back up the chain and say, this is too difficult. And the messages we're getting back is that we are causing damage by doing this. We can't feed it back up. So you get a failure in the feedback loop, which then ultimately means that more and more risk gets taken, and then you get a catastrophic failure. That is my fear, is that at a societal level, we are replicating the failures that happened within the financial system through the financial crisis on my desk. And now we're doing that at a societal level. Quickly, thank you very much for your time. That's it from Renegade Inc. this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com, or you can tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Mm -hmm.